This show is brought to you by Anchor.fm. Anchor is the easiest way to make podcast. It's free. There are tools for you to record and edit your podcast from your phone on web. Anchor also helps you to distribute your podcast to Spotify, Apple Podcast and likes. You can also monetize your podcast with minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Hello and welcome to TC39ers. Happy New Year 2021. With me today we have Ujwal Sharma. Hi Ujwal and very happy to have you on the show. Hello and thanks for inviting me. It's really nice to be here and talk about some of these amazing things. Awesome. Uh, Ujwal is a compiler hacker at Egalia. Of course, as a TC39 delegate and also a core collaborator uh, on the Node.js project. Uh, he is into JavaScript, C++, and REST. And he also uh, is into speaking. Um, welcome to the show, Ujwal. And let's get started. Like, Super curious on what got you into the tech and what interests you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, that's That's a really... On on one hand, that's that's a really interesting question, but also one that I tend to rant about a lot. Uh, but long story short, I think uh, I, I genuinely believe that tech is is the thing for me. You know, like like they say in the books, uh, and and I know that sounds a little bit cheesy at least, but it generally is. I I really enjoy working on tech. And it really aligns with my vision. It, it really aligns with my sort of uh, worldview, you could say. So I really think that tech is is one of the most powerful ways in which one could, uh, you know, influence the world as it is right now. And so I I decided to get into tech. Awesome. So did you did you get started with Egalia or what what does Egalia do and what interests you in Egalia? And we do hear that you're an hacker on compilers. Uh, could you expand more on that? Yeah. Yeah. Iga- I, I didn't start programming with Egalia per se, but Egalia is definitely my my first full time tech job. Uh and it's it's really interesting that you ask about it. So Egalia is a company uh, that is really special, at least to me, because it it really matches with my values. Egalia is a software consultancy that works exclusively on free and open source software. We are sort of an anarchist co-op, which means that we are run in a really interesting way. There's no... Uh, there's no executives, there's no uh, C-suit in Igalia. It's just a bunch of hackers that love to write code and, and who love to share their gifts with the world. So we work on different projects and, and come together. Uh, and if you know certain decisions need to be made, we make them in, in uh, consensus. So it's not quite different from how we take decisions in CC39. We just sit together and we talk about things. Uh, and about so there's there's many teams at Egalia which work in different sort of branches of software. I work specifically in the compilers team, which works uh, which work on compilers generally, but more specifically we work on JavaScript and and WebAssembly compilers. <clears throat> uh, personally, I uh, mostly spend my time these days working on TC39 stuff, um, almost exclusively at this point. But every uh, once in a while, on and off, I, I work on V8. But all in all, the team itself works on uh, you know other compilers like GSC, like SpiderMonkey, uh, CraneLift uh, for you know, WebAssembly, and, and so on. It's it's super interesting to hear that a company is uh, consulting on uh, free and open source software, and and that's that's an amazing area to explore. And I personally haven't heard of, about a lot of companies which do that. And you must be really lucky to be in one such. Yeah, I certainly 
do feel so given my personal uh my personal interest given my personal appreciation for open source software and also for sort of the the structure that Egalia has i'm certainly really lucky uh as you pointed out uh to have this as sort of my first job because it, it feels like the job for me right because uh you know not all teams spend as much time working on open source software as uh as we do so and also a lot of really really amazing people uh even in tc39 i see every every day don't get to work on tc39 for example full time mm -hmm. so i think i i count myself really lucky <laughs> in that area awesome and 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 if you were to talk about uh, your contributions with Node.js, uh, what what uh, parts of uh, the Node.js project interest you the most? And I presume it's more on the V8 uh, perspective of it. Or, yeah. And also, like, what do you think was uh, what do you think is still a barrier uh, for a few of them who wants to get into uh, you know the core contribution uh, on the Node.js project? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Node.js is uh, is a project that is really dear to me. Not only because it's a it's a project that I really like and appreciate from from a purely technological point of view, but also it's it's uh, at least in my personal subjective opinion one of the nicest communities uh, to work with out there, which basically also explains why I got uh, so lucky with Node.js is that there's all these really interesting, helpful people in Node.js who are always willing to sort of uh, and, and welcoming to newer contributors. Uh, yeah, as, as you <laughs> uh, guessed, I mostly these days I work on the on the V8 side of things in Node.js. Unfortunately, I'm not working quite uh, as you could say quite as uh, frequently these days as I could. As I said, I uh, I have to focus on V8 sorry, <laughs> TC39 uh, for, for my day job. So that sort of keeps me occupied. But yeah, from every, every once in a while, we do V8 upgrades. So, so I'm uh, responsible for, for many of those. And uh, we also maintain a build system in Node.js. Uh, it's called JIP. And I think everybody who's built like a uh, Node.js native module uh, knows the pain of, uh, you know, using JIP. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we, we also maintain JIP and I, I, uh, have been, uh, focusing on that for, for the last couple of months, you could say as well. Yeah. Uh, to the second part of the question we were discussing on, uh, do you think oh, yeah. there are certain barriers in lives? Uh, no, there, well, there aren't, as I said, but then you're, you're not wrong. There also kind of are. So when, when I think about the barriers that, that have like, that, that were, in, you could say influential in my case was, you could say purely the fact maybe that no GS relies so heavily on C++. Uh, most of the core is written in C++. So as a as a user of Node, who wrote JavaScript, uh, it, it it was complicated for me to just pick up C++. But I, I realized that it was not as hard as it seemed at at the beginning. So if anybody is out there starting out or or maybe just considering, I would really recommend that they give it a try. It's not as complicated as you think it is because I I frankly. Uh, had the same opinion and it turned out not to be the other thing is that uh unlike many other projects that i've worked with uh, or mm -hmm. was previously working with before node.js node.js has uh, node.js employs a a lot of really uh you know really you could say complex pieces of of uh, technology uh especially you know on the on the system side of things so there's things like an event loop, which people know about. Well, you know, mm -hmm. all the all the underpinnings of the event loop are surely complicated, as you could have guessed. There's things like 
libuvine itself, which I feel is is a little bit scary to me. Uh, yeah. You know, things like how build systems work, things like you know how to how to statically link files and so on and so forth were all sort of alien to me. But I guess you can get the hang of it if if uh, somebody really wants to get into it. I think mm -hmm. Node.js has a fantastic community and and a great bunch of people. Uh, who would be really happy to help you out with everything. That's awesome. The The community spirit of Node.js, of course, is really great. And um, uh, before we get into uh, the final uh, you know, piece of the, the podcast, like, uh, that would, of course, be discussion on uh, what's uh, your uh, you know, contributions with TC39 and how did you get into TC39. We, I'd like to take a quick segue and uh, probably talk about Rust uh, I do see you You are into Rust. What is your opinion about Rust? Yeah, as <laughs> I, so there's two sides of things, right? I, I'm a Rust hobbyist in that I, I got to know about Rust and I tried it out and I think it's, it's really something, it's really something out of the future. You know, it's, it's a, it's a systems programming language that feels really, easy to grasp but at the but at the end of the day it has some really uh, interesting uh, semantics you could say it has some really interesting features that make it uh, a truly delightful programming language to write in but apart from that i think uh, another part about me that explains why i'm so into rust is <laughs> that i am a c++ programmer and so, like all other C++ programmers, I hate C++. So, mm -hmm. it's Rust is certainly, I think, a, a step in an interesting direction. And I think, uh, I think it's not so far into the future when more and more projects uh, that are written mm -hmm. in C++ mm -hmm. today would be written in Rust. Uh, and and we we can see this happening in real time. Projects like ICU for X, right? Uh, ICU for C. Uh, is just like one of the uh, most important libraries when it comes to internationalization and whatnot. And it's like, it's it's a well-known uh, library in the C++ ecosystem. And to see that people are working on porting it to Rust is just so amazing. Awesome, yeah. It, it, it's it's a definitely a, a, a language with a lot of potential and we do see a few many proposals even in uh, TC39, getting influenced by Rust and likes. And with that, uh, Ujwal, let's get into this question of uh, what got you into TC39. And I do uh, know that you your day job uh, is to work on TC39, uh, maybe proposals or a few of the implementations, which is like amazing thing to do. And uh, what brought, brought you into and what are your contributions? And probably if you were to pick one of the uh, favorite proposals, uh, we could talk more about that. Surely. Uh, so what got me into TC39 is a fun story. I, I did a thing that happened to me once and I talk about and, and joke about it with friends a lot is that I, I was a programmer in university and I was just like, you know, as everyone programming, I was a CS student. Uh, so that's pretty, uh, you know, and that's that's on the books. It's really common, uh, right? But at the same time, I was working on open source software, and I I reached a point where I was just writing code, uh, and 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 looking forward to more things, not necessarily getting deeper into things. So, I had a I had a mentor, sort of. Uh, I had a senior in university who who wanted me to get better at stuff, and he told me, well, you know, you cannot stop. Uh, you have to keep digging into stuff and, and mm -hmm. keep digging until you reach the point where, you know, you're, you're into lower level programming. And I, I really stuck by that. <laughs> Unfortunately for that guy, I, <laughs> I dug too deep. So I started out working mm -hmm. on Node Core and then I realized, okay, maybe I should work on V8. And so, you know, thanks to some of the, uh, some of the amazing people in the V8 team who gladly mentored me and helped me uh, understand everything that was going on and sort of make 
uh, useful changes to the code base because you know I, I had no formal education in compilers uh, pre like before that. Of course, after I started working on V8, I took a compilers course in university, uh, but I already knew about compilers by that point. So yeah, and then like at some point I realized, okay, so what's deeper than this? Well, certainly the specification is is a level deeper, you could say. <laughs> so that that basically brought me into TC39, and and I guess now I cannot go further deep unless I get into the get into the design of the English language itself. <laughs> the, the grammar and the syntax and of course all of that is there. Yeah. Well, I mean, so, linguistics is fun, right? <laughs> yeah, that that would be a podcast in itself. So a uh, bit of an offbeat here, like me and Ujwal uh, were discussing about uh, philosophy, life, and all of that, and which, if recorded, could have been a, a long discussion in itself. And getting back to track again, Ujwal, like, what is your favorite uh, proposal? Uh, Maybe uh, one it's com one of those which are completed or probably in any of the mm -hmm. stages uh, in TC39 and why? Yeah, I so there's so many. Uh, it, it makes me there's there's so many really amazing proposals, so many promising proposals, uh, like, you know, class features and records and tuples that just make the the life of everyone so much easier. But I think I, I might be a little biased here, but I think one of my personal favorites is Tempro. Uh, I say I'm biased because that's the one that I pretty much work full time on right now. But apart from that, there's so many stakeholders on uh, Temporal. So Temporal is not my thing, really. It's it's so many people involved in the effort. Uh, that said, I truly believe in the potential of Temporal. I think it, it makes everyone's lives so much easier. And I think it's uh, you you pretty much know it already, being a TC39 delegate, but the fact that it's so well-loved by the rest of the committee is a, is a great uh you know, uh, it, it, it's a really good proof of this this feeling for me is that everybody likes the direction we're headed to. Awesome. So, so um, where do you see uh, temporal heading? On what impact do you think would uh, it uh, and uh, cause for developers? Like, would we be replacing some of the a famous helper libraries that that have been like integrated to few many repos for managing you know, date and time. Yeah. Or... Yeah, I, I I think that's certainly the direction that I want things to head into. Temporal is temporal is fixing fixing a sort of gap in JavaScript that is pretty well known at this point, right? I mean, JavaScript date is is pretty unusable uh, by and, and anybody who's tried to use that API pretty much understands this. And so the, the, the biggest indicator of this, as you pointed out, is the fact that so many people who use uh, dates and times in JavaScript have to use something like moment.js or, or, you know, uh, these days more often they use something like Luxon, which is, which is great. It, it gets the job done. But there is a there is a need for something that's in the language that is enshrined in the language, and it helps uh, it helps people do these things within the language because some of the costs of these APIs, uh, you know, especially the data cost, is something that cannot be that cannot be fixed. You cannot make a new API uh, that is zero kilobytes, right? But also, I think. That while this was the original intention of temporal, I think that temporal has just, you know, it, it's been like over two years, maybe, ever since temporal was first conceived, and it just keeps on giving, right? At first, it was it was aiming to sort of fix this issue that I talked about and sort of replace Moment.js and, and Luxon and whatnot, and then slowly we sort of expanded the scope to have features that were previously unheard of in JavaScript land. There's no library that does things like nanosecond precision timing, right? Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. there's no libraries that do uh, multi-calendar support, like non-Gregorian calendar supported, third-party calendar support, and, and custom time zones, custom calendars. So some of these things were certainly 
uh, you know, getting interesting to the point where some of these changes were not only uh, not done so far, uh, but like some of them were literally impossible to be done in New Zealand. You cannot make a NVM library uh, to to just you know do any of these, irrespective of how much JavaScript code you write. It's it's a feature that needs to be added on a language level, and I think we're even beyond this point now. So I, I don't know if if you've been uh, one hundred percent up to date with what we've been doing these few weeks, but Temporal has pretty much pioneered a a new format, right? In, if when you represent dates and times in computation on the internet on the web, people usually use the ISO format or the IETF RSC 336 format, uh, sorry, 339, right? Uh, but yeah, they use this ISO format of dates and times, which is, you know, w w w what most software uses because it's it, it works with all sort of different pieces of software. And uh, at Temporal, we push things to the point where we realize that this this dated, this old format is not sufficient in, in the modern world anymore. And so I've been working, the last couple of weeks, I've been working on a new draft that will be submitted to IETF and it would replace this old uh, RFC and it would be a new RFC uh, and it sort of updates the format. Uh, so I, I think we have even pioneered a new format for representing dates and times in the web, one that uh, you know can represent dates in different calendars, one that can uh, represent dates with different time scales and so on. Yeah, I was following that and that's like awesome. And, and, and with the interest of time, uh, which will be need to probably, oh, you know, end the podcast here and looking forward for more such discussions and uh, i would you know link your twitter account um, in this podcast post and we'll let all the people pester you with more of node.js and tc39 <laughs> it's it's not a trouble at all uh, and thank you so much for inviting me it's been really cool talking to you uh, of course as we do always but also it was really nice being on this podcast and talking about these things Awesome. And this is Heymond, your host of TC39ers, and stay tuned for more such episodes.